Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, Andy Clavett here, the host of the System Simplified Podcast, where I interview top founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And today's episode is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group where we create, document, and implement processes and procedures so businesses can grow and thrive. And if you want to know how we do it, I'm going to include in the show notes and link to the episode that we have done about our proven process so you can see what an ideal training manual looks like. All right, and now it's time to introduce today's guest, which is Todd Tasky. Hi, Todd. Hello, uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. We're going to have a great conversation today about exiting the business. And this is always an exciting subject. It's an interesting subject. It's a subject that entrepreneurs are very, very interested in because we work so hard, but we want to reap the benefits of our businesses, right? So we're going to discuss that. But before I'm going to introduce you properly, and your bio, and we're going to start talking. I'd like to give a big shout out to Jeremy and John from Rice25. It seems like there are a lot of episodes that I'm giving them a shout out because there are such connectors that I have a guest on my podcast that I don't even know they are connected, and then we are connected. You know, I, I invited you to be on this podcast. I look at your LinkedIn, and then I see that you are connected to Jeremy Wise. I asked you, how come? And you said, well, they are producing our podcast. So it seems like Jeremy, John, and Rice25 is like everywhere producing podcasts and doing a fantastic job. So big shout out to Jeremy and John. And also a shout out to Russell Benaroya, who you were on his podcast. You did a fantastic, it was a fantastic episode and um, led me to invite you to this one. Well, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I think it's, you know, what's interesting is that a lot of people, when they think about exit, they think that this is the end of the road or the end of my career or the end of this business, I'm gonna sell my business and, and I'm gonna exit and be done. And many of the transactions that we do as, as we view the world are not so much exit opportunities as they are evolutionary opportunities. And, I love that. And, and so people, level. yeah, and people have the opportunity mid-career or even earlier in their career to do a transaction that A, provides real liquidity, B, continues them as an owner in the larger entity or a, a bigger entity, but also gives them a lot more resources, you know, from, from financial resources to support resources in finance and accounting and other areas that really allow them to accelerate the the growth of their business in ways that they had not thought. Many of these trophies over my shoulder are examples of people that have done transactions like that. And, and the vernacular in, in my space is the second bite, right? Where folks focus on a second bite that oftentimes is many, many times greater than the initial liquidity that they, you know, they take off the table. And, I'll, you know, as we talk, I'll, I'll share some of those stories. Absolutely. Well, let's start with a proper bio, okay? So you are a 20 plus year investment banker and business advisor, specifically for founders and CEOs. And you have helped a dozen of founders and you, you specialize in the um, 1 million to 4 million market, right? Yeah, of EBITDA, right? Of, of EBITDA. net profit. So yes, well, for clients that are over a million, um, we closed a transaction, you know, last week where they were six and a half ish million of EBITDA. Um, but most often our clients are somewhere probably between two and five million dollars of EBITDA. OK, great. And you basically your tra the transactions that you help create, create current liquidity and much more significant upside with less personal risk. A hundred percent. So. In a typical, I'll give you an example, and in, in, in I can share the details or the name, but I can't share both. So I'll give you just the details of this because I think it's very helpful. So I, we had clients that are were in the digital marketing space, 
They're a husband and wife team. Uh, this is going back to 2019, so about four years ago. They were about 2 million of EBITDA on 10 million of revenue. All of their revenue was recurring. And these guys, Eddie, had great systems that ran their business. It's systems literally for everything. And that helped make the buyer very comfortable. It helped make the lending institution very comfortable and, and made the entire process much, much easier. But to put it in context, that client got, they when we sold them to a smaller private equity group, they got 8 million in cash at close. They got a $1 million earn out, which they collected all of at the end of 12 months. And they retained 40% of the business. Fast forward that business. So remember, they in 2019, we closed that transaction in thank, at thank, Thanksgiving week. So they finished the year right about 2 million of EBITDA. They closed last year, which was 2022, at 18 million of EBITDA. And they'll close this year over 20 million of EBITDA. Wow. And in the digital marketing space, a business like that will trade for it probably 15 or 16 times EBITDA. Wow. So that's a, that's a $300 million valuation. Now, the company has, I, I think, 30 or $40 million of debt from some of the transactions they've done. And through those transactions, my clients have been diluted down to about 25% ownership. But four years ago, they sold 60% of their business for about $9 million. And today, the 40% they didn't sell, you know, is probably worth 50-ish million dollars. And they have been having more fun over the last three years than they did in the, you know, the 10 years prior to that. And two important things. So first of all, the $30 million of debt or 40, whatever they have, nobody's personally obligated for that debt, right? You have professional investors and private equity money and the, no individual that speaks to there being less risk to them. But also this couple that own the business were in their early 50s. And as they said to me, you know, when, when we closed this deal, they said, Todd, you know, we've been saving our money along the way. So we're pretty comfortable. We pick up 8 million bucks, man. We're, we're set. Our risk tolerance went from three all the way up to 10. Plus all the money we're going to spend on things in the future. That's all private equity money. Of course, we'll do all those things, right? And so, so that's one example. Many of these over my shoulder are trophies of other deals that are in some stage of that process, some to lesser, some to greater degrees of success. Um, but when we talk about that with people that I get introduced to, what I hear most often, Addy, is I didn't know that you could do that. I thought if you sold your business, you were out and that was it. I didn't realize I could get liquidity, get more resources, and still have ownership, significant ownership in a business. And, and that's the kind of transaction we enjoy creating the most. That's great. Well, I have some questions for you. So what, um, let's say we have entrepreneurs who are listening to us right now. They're in that range of, you know, one to $4 million in EBITDA, a little bit more. Um, and they're thinking, wow, that sounds like a very inspiring story. At what point, at what stage should they start thinking about that exit strategy? And it's not a complete exit, but it's basically, that's why you call it sold in, per, in, in quotation marks, right? right? You sell some of the business, you're getting in the private equity in there, you're, you're liquid, you get a liquidity, but you're still part of the business. At what point do you suggest that they start thinking about it? So I'll clarify a couple of things and answer that question. So when somebody does a transaction like the one I described, or just about any transaction, the buyer will acquire 100% of their business. And then the question becomes, what are they going to use for currency? And typically, the currency is cash, and then also equity in the new business. And then, you know, we'll spend plenty of time talking about, well, what's that equity really worth? And we think that's fair and are the measures the same and on and on from there. 
So, so that's really the, the first part. You'll sell 100%, but you may own a very significant, let's just say to, for simple math, the value of the business is $10 million and you take $7 million and you roll forward $3 million. First of all, that roll forward is, if you do it properly, is not taxed at that time. And now you have $3 million of equity in the new company. And most would hope that that $3 million will double or triple or quadruple over a three or four or five year period of time. So that's the, the typical infrastructure or the, the typical setup of a deal. I hear more often, way more often than not, regardless of how sloppy things are in a business, you know, we can fix it up and we can make sure the financials are right. And we'll tell an honest and straightforward story. And, and if the business is, is a good business, we'll sell it. It's a lot easier, a lot easier if they're organized because you'll be forced to be, I mean, there's a process of due diligence where the client's going to ask, the buyer's going to ask you for all of your contract, your employment records, your bank records, your credit card records, your lease arrangements, your, I mean, on and on and on, right? And, and for some, it's just give them access to our data room. And for others, it's like, oh my God, I don't, I don't have corporate documentation. I don't have my, I don't have employment of contracts. I, and, and so they scramble and it's just much harder. So basically what you're saying is you can think about it, but make sure that you're organized and be prepared, like be basically be prepared to actually go through this process. You can do it the easy way or the hard way, right? The easy way is, you know, it's like selling a house. People fix up their house right at the end and they make it beautiful and then they give it to somebody else. I know, right? And then you go, well, maybe I should just stay here. It or so they say, better. why didn't we do this like two years ago? And then we could have lived in a beautiful house with fresh painting and nice landscaping and enjoyed all of this. Exactly. Exactly. So being well organized just makes the business better when you organize it, when you create systems. It makes it better right now. If you want to then sell it right now, then that's great. If not, you certainly benefit from the effort you've put in to organize and systematize your business. That's Absolutely. the story that, that you tell all the time. That's true. So it's basically think of, I mean, and I like that analogy, right? I mean, if you live in a house, think about how you maintain the house as if though you're going to sell it tomorrow, right? Keep it in top shape and enjoy it. Enjoy it because it's just so much more enjoyable. Absolutely. So, um, Tell me, what are some of your favorite deals? Like, how do you like to structure a deal? I mean, that that story that you told me is fabulous, right? So, mm -hmm. but what are some of the key components when you when you uh, structure a deal that you feel like it's for the benefit of the entrepreneur to actually give them the option to take that second bite and go forward? Right. So, and we will do some exit transactions. We, we've worked with, you know, we sold a company in um, Chicago last year. The gentleman was 72 years old and there was the final chapter for him and we got him a great transaction that worked out wonderfully. So, and those are easier because that the measure there is money. Who pays us the most amount of money and the one who pays us the most wins. They can have it, right? The Exit transaction is all about the roll for it. So let me give you an example. On my, um, we've got a bunch of folks on our podcast that have successfully done transactions. And so there's- And by the way, one, the name of the podcast is The Second Byte. Yeah, The Second Byte Podcast is the website, Second Byte Podcast. And what you will hear are uh, entrepreneurs that have been through this process. Um, you'll talk, there's lawyers on there, there's private equity guys on there, there's accountants on there. And so you can hear about, you can hear from private equity guys, what they look for when they, because they, they, they look companies all the time and how they tell good ones from bad ones, how they think about fits and on, and on like that. And so I'll give you an example. We're working on a project right now. And my client is a little bit over 2 million of EBITDA and he does conversion rate optimization, which means any e-commerce company, when they, 
have their e-commerce website, how they maximize conversion is what conversion rate optimization is. And this guy does it at the highest levels and is one of the best that I've seen. And we've been doing it for a long time. He doesn't really have a sales team, if you will. He could go, he's growing at 35% a year. He could grow at 50 or 60% a year because there's so much demand for his service. But then, so he's got to build out a sales team. He's got to add an HR function and he's got to add training of his people. I said, well, gosh, so you could do that. We can partner with private equity and they'll help you and support you in doing that, right? That's option one. So you could take several million dollars off the table, have equity, and then the private equity guys who have built companies like this will help you do that. That's option one. Option two, why don't we find somebody in the space doing that now that does digital marketing and marketing strategy for e-commerce brands? that doesn't do CRO or doesn't do it well. And so as an example, last night we had a conversation and the group that we were talking to, which is a private equity owned company, they have this little chart, right? And on this little chart, it's here's the stuff we're good at. Here's the stuff we're not good at, but really need to be good at. And the first one is e-commerce and CRO. These guys have like six salespeople. They have 400 customers, 400 customers. My guy's got like 60. And, and so we hung up the phone. He's like, oh my God, that's everything I wanted. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll kill it there. Now, remember their 400 customers look to those guys to say, how do we get more? How do we get new customers? How do we get more customers convert? What are your answers? Then you're going to bring my guy in and, and my guy's tremendous. He'll start talking and, and, and the customer, he's got a close rate of 86%, my client, 86% when he gets in front of somebody, they'll walk him. It'll be a home run for everybody. So Absolutely. the question, the question to my guy is how much cash do you want up front? So again, let's say the buyer says, Hey, the company's worth 10 million bucks of the 10 million. How much do you want in cash? How much do you want in stock of the bigger combined company? And he'll find some balance in there that is good for him, that is also good for the buyer. And we'll write a letter of intent. And then we'll get lawyers involved and we'll argue about every little nit and nat that could possibly happen or possibly go wrong or whatever. And in 60 days, we'll, you know, we'll have a deal closed. Wow, amazing. But isn't like that company depends on your, I mean, I, I'd like actually to touch on that subject. Isn't that company depends on the ability of your client to close or your ability of your clients to deliver the service? Yes. So can your guy really do that, Todd? Does he know, can he do it? And I say, look, look at the logos they have. Look at the customers. And, and now we get very specific. Look at his retention. Look at their revenue growth. Look, you know, of course, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a sales guy. I'm going to sell you on all the great things. Don't look, look to the data. And this is what all good buyers do. This is why you need to have your stuff organized, right? What's your retention been over the last three years? What's your revenue growth been over the last three years? And as I say all the time, when, when a guy of this size has clients like that, there's got to be a reason why you should really find out what that reason is, right? And then my job for my client, so we're going to get four offers for him probably next week. And he's met with all, and, and this is the way our system works or the investment banking system works. So we've had a, a bunch of introductory one hour phone calls with a bunch of different groups. And one of the things I learned early on, Addy, is guys, I say generically, men or women clients, will say, yeah, I want private equity or I want this or I want that. They don't know what they want because they haven't, they haven't had the chance to interact yet and they don't know all the stuff that's out there. So I want a good deal, maximum value, but I also want clarity of decision. Right. And the only way you get clarity is to have multiple data points. So we've spoke to a bunch. We'll get 
four offers. We will probably invite those four to come for what's known as a management presentation. Management presentation is three and a half or four hours. It usually starts with that group spending 30 or 45 minutes saying, this is why we're great. This is why this combination would be wonderful. We love you. You should love us. And, and then it shifts to about three hours of us talking about all the things you just described. Service offering. Here's how we deliver. Here's our, here's our management team. Here's how we're organized. On and on and on. Here's why we lost those clients. Here's what we learned from these clients. And, we, and they talk about what the fit is because that's where the real reward is, right? So from that perspective, uh, that's kind of what the process, typical banking process looks like. Interesting. Now, what about the feeling of like, you know, a lot of, oh, I want to use a generality, but, you know, for me, for interacting with many entrepreneurs, we actually did a survey and we asked, what is it? What did you like most about being a business owner? And the number one answer that I got, 95%, I actually wrote an article about it too. In, in, it got published in Inc. Magazine. It, the number one answer was freedom. That's what they like most about being a business owner. Of course, then we ask what frustrates you most about being a business owner. And then you hear about all the things that are preventing from having that freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So as entrepreneurs, you know, you have your own freedom. Yes, like a good friend of mine said, you have the freedom of choose which uh, 12 hours a day do you want to work. <laughs> so you can start in the morning until night or night until morning, whatever. But when you actually have now, you don't have full ownership, right? And I, do you lose some of that freedom that comes with being your own, the owner of your own business? Yeah, so I'll give you three comments on that. Number one, when they acquire you, if you hit your numbers and if you perform, they work for you. If you miss your numbers, if you don't perform, now you work for them. Now you show up, now you punch a time clock, now you follow the rules. What Number two, what most buyers want is all the stuff you showed me in the deck, the presentation, the things we talked about at the management meeting, and most importantly, your financials. That's what I bought. That's what I want. I don't really care how you do it, right? If you can do all of that in four hours a day, terrific. If you like to golf in the morning and then work, I don't care. If you don't work on Fridays in the summer, I don't care. If you go to Switzerland and work from there all summer long, I don't care. Just make sure this thing runs. That's what you'll find for most people. And then Similar to what you said at the beginning, my third point, I hear all the time, yeah, you know, I wouldn't be a good employee to somebody else. And I say, let me ask you a question. You're at your kid's soccer game and the game's about to start and your number one customer calls you at four o'clock on Friday. What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to answer the phone. Then you're going to go walk to the car. And if it takes an hour, you'll take an hour. What if your number two client calls? What if your number 16 client calls? So this the concept of I can do whatever I want a little bit from my perspective is an immature assessment of how much freedom you actually have. Yeah, I mean, as I told you, that's what my friend is is great entrepreneur. She told me like, you know, you what's the freedom, the freedom to choose with which 12 or 16 hours a day you work, right? Yeah, so and it, it's also, right, You there's certain things you can manage that we manage in life. We manage everything in life. Right. We call them priorities. And so many great entrepreneurs prioritize business over a lot of things. That's why they're so good at business. Right. The fact that you have a, quote unquote, a boss, what you'll hear from many buyers, they'll never use the word, geez, now that we bought your company, you work for us. It's, it's, a, we're a partnership now, right? I own stock, you own stock. We're in this thing together. And we both want our stock to triple or quadruple. How do you want to do it? Let's figure out, and this is stuff you should talk about before you do a deal, right? 
how do you work? Here's how we work. Do you think this is fun? How often do you have to come out to Seattle? How often I'm in Bethesda, Maryland? How often do I need to be in Bethesda? Do we all come to the office? Do we not? None of this should be a surprise, you know, the day after close. This is all vetted out. And I tell people all the time, never, ever, ever lie about something, right? Because, you, you know, it's like lying about your emotional needs when you're getting married. That doesn't make any sense. The, the goal is not to get married. The goal is to stay married, right? Especially right. in these type of transactions, right? If you're an exit transaction, man, just get to close. And if you're going to roll down, that's fine, Right. If you want to do a, a second bite transaction, it just there's, and this is why we love it so much. There's a lot of art that gets mixed into the science of doing a transaction. And the art is who do you, where do you feel the fit is best for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. You know, Todd, this has been very, very um, enlightening conversation because I'm sure a lot of our listeners you know, didn't even give it a thought. That's why I started by asking, when should, where, when should you think about it? And it seems like from your answer, you should think about it now, but make sure everything is in order and everything is organized. But this is an option to still have, to be able to expand your business as well. I mean, that's the way I look at it, you know, in terms of like, you can have the liquidity, have the lifestyle that you want, maybe really achieve that freedom that you wanted as an entrepreneur, because now you have access to resources to actually create all those systems that you will need in order to be able not to be a slave to the business because honestly you know if you have a business that is going but you know you have to hire more people or if i could just implement this software if i could help if i could hire that person the business i know will scale i just don't have the capital to do that this is a great way to do that i mean it, it really is i'm sure all of your clients realize and all the folks listening realize there's some things I'm not good at. Right. And, and we overcompensate for those in other ways. And if you could solve for that with a good partnership and a good arrangement, then that that's why a lot of folks find themselves much happier post-transaction because they're really go, they're going back to the very early days of their business when they, did less managing a business and more of what we call the good stuff, which is taking care of clients, making them happy, being creative, solving problems, you know, those kind of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Todd, let's um, thank you very much for being a guest on this podcast. My pleasure. I'd like to give you right now, if you can give us how to get a hold of you, because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are like, okay, I want to talk to Todd. So how can sure. I And if, you know, so uh, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm sure that Jeremy will put it in the show notes. So feel free to reach out there. Uh, my email will be there as well. And then on the podcast, and, and this, I find this very interesting. I could go on for another couple of hours, but what's better than me rambling on and on is actually listening to other founders and CEOs and they'll talk about their experience and what that was like. And, and that's why we started the Second Byte podcast so that people could hear from others that have done it. And I get a lot of good feedback as far as that being a good resource. So um, so they can go to find me on LinkedIn and, and, and check on Second Byte Podcast. Absolutely. And we'll include that, as you said, in the show notes. Well, thank you very much, Todd. I really appreciate you being a guest on this podcast. It was great being a part of it, Adi. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.